million dollar liability. And it's not going to get smaller over time. <coughs> so um, we, there were a couple of things we looked at besides the funding, be, besides the, the uh, you know, we can talk about this $500,000 or a piece of free cash going forward, but having a steady stream of revenue going in there, having its own steady stream would make more sense. So one thing would be the um, Medicare D reimbursement, which is really from the retirees themselves anyway, and it's uh, you know it's it's a combination of the um, what the town and the employees or the retired employees pay in for benefits for their own health insurance policies. So when that comes back from the federal government, it would make sense to have this go right into the um, the OPEB fund to help pay for it. Last year we received about $140,000. We received about $120,000 a year to date. Uh, I don't expect it would go over $150,000 at any time. There's a, a flat $400 per um, Medicare policy uh, that we receive. So that, that's one thing. And the second thing we were looking at as a stream of payments would be once the retirement system is paid off, and it has to be paid off by 2023 or 25, I'm not sure exactly the end date. But when that happens, if we could divert the portion that is for past due liability, there will always be a current liability, but if we could divert the portions from past due liability to the OPEP fund, and this is something that, again, that Floyd and I had discussed, right to the OPEP, that gives another steady stream of revenue. Uh, and so that, those are two different ideas. It sort of rolls everything into one because, um, but I... One is immediate now and here and now. The other one's, one off in the One's off in the future, future so. correct. Um, Angela, you have the last word, not the first. Well, I'm just curious <laughs> as to what we're currently using the money for. Oh, yeah. Well, it, last year was the first year we got it, actually. And uh, the state said it could not be used as an estimated receipt going into the future because you cannot count on it. The federal government is not, cannot be counted on for reimbursements of any kind. They just, they just <laughs> don't always happen. Like the state government. Like the state government. They just don't happen. So this just goes into free cash. Right now, right. It just flows right in as a, a non-recurring expense. That's what they call it, non-recurring. So Barbara, with this proposed Warren article just do the first, not the second. Correct. Correct. The, it's not an article. It's, it's not, not an article. article. There is something in here. Actually. There is. There is. A, if there, uh, can, I, can I speak on that, please? It's, uh, there is an article in there, but it's also corrective legislation because it, it, I, I have to tell you that um, we've been working with the attorney, Floyd and I, again, to not only do you have to have legislation to create the OPEP fund, we then have to go to the IRS, again, federal government, uh, to uh, get permission to have this as a tax-free entity so that we won't be taxed upon it. And in order to do that, we had to write up a, 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 an agreement, a trust agreement, that the IRS would accept for a tax-free fund. And when the attorney was working on it, she felt that our home rule petition needed to be clarified in order to make that run smoothly. So this is a clarifying legislation. And as Jeff stated last week, uh, the attorney had felt that it's best to roll the idea of the Medicare D reimbursement right into that language. Doesn't that that's not well, that kind of confines us, you know. That's, Mike's right. The Medicare D is in this is in Article 18. Yeah, it's an, it's, it's part of Article 18. It's part of our, which is the the changing of the Home Rule petition, correct? So there are really two. So we'll just put the pension piece out. You were just correct. talking put about the, that. Yeah, that's way in the future. Picture. Okay. Right. Right. So this article then does two things. One, it's a house cleaning, I guess. Correct. I say, and then the other is a poli not an unimportant policy decision. Correct. I think, I mean, the house cleaning, you know, fine, but the, the policy decision, I, I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with the policy decision. Okay. And so I think it needs some, I mean, if the override failed and we had to go ahead and put 140000 into this, I regret that. Well, it was getting a little ahead of the discussion here, but our, I mean, when we talk about Article 18, it's got 18B, 
which is the, the where the money comes from, has at least three sections. One is all amounts appropriated or otherwise made available. And I don't understand why that couldn't include a year-to-year -year decision about what to do with Medicare Part D. What, you know, right. and, and two is all amounts contributed or otherwise made available by employees. And three is Medicare Part D. So if we had, if we throw Medicare Part D into the legislation, and once we do that, we're, when we're saying forever, we'll contribute Medicare Part D. We, we started out with special, with a, just an article directing those funds uh, into OPEB, and the attorney said that, wanted, you spoke to the attorney about why you didn't like that language. Right, but I think uh, the chairman's question remains. Uh, it, it, if we want to establish a dedicated revenue stream coming from the Medicare Part D reimbursements that is uh, applies through every fiscal year and doesn't have to be revoted each time, then this legislation is the appropriate means to do that. But it sounds like you're just questioning whether you want to do that. Well, my, my I question. certainly am. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes, and, so, yeah, I, I'm questioning that as well. I mean, if it doesn't go here, then it goes into free cash, and then we have the opportunity to discuss whether we want to continue the level of funding for that. Is that a great yeah. the level of funding each year? And I'd rather approach it with that flexibility in mind. Barbara. Can I, um, I understand what you were saying about the DOR, and they were talking about OPEP being not something mm -hmm. acceptable here in Massachusetts, or has not been accepted widely in Massachusetts, but it has been around the rest of the country. The rest of the country is already looking at funding the system. They're already looking at the whole picture. When Moody comes in, to evaluate us, they're comparing us not to the other cities and towns here in Massachusetts, they're comparing us to the rest of the country. They're comparing us to Alaska and, and Alabama and Mississippi and, and California. They're not comparing. We look good compared to California. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think Mississippi's right first, I want to ask a <laughs> But yeah, so, sorry. as Floyd was stating, uh, and this was in a conversation we had last week, we need to show that we have a steady stream of revenue, that, that we have, it's not just a, a whim of this, there's available money this year, we'll put it in, but we can come out next year. But if we had a steady stream of revenue coming from two sources eventually, and that is part of the policy, and please, please Floyd, this was our conversation, so please jump in if you, if you like. Well, I th I guess I think we understand the right. the Medicare Part D thing, um, and we can fold that into the discussion on Article 18. Um, and I don't, you know, it, it's just from my perspective, it's one thing to say we think we should have a policy of the town of Belmont to fund OPEP. It's quite another to have legislation that says every year you have to do it at a particular level. And so I, I would like to, re I mean, me personally, I would like to retain some local control over what we do with that money. And if the, if the state legislature passes a law that says we have to do it, which we ask them to pass, then the only way we don't do it is by getting them to re-vote it, which seems to me that's not someplace I really want to go. Um, but anyway, Bill. Quick, can we find out what the potential use is? Can we put that in a free cash? I'd just like to have us, before we discuss the article, can we find out? It goes uh, into free cash now. It, can it, it goes into free cash now? Yes. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chozo. Angel. I was just going to echo your point. We had talked about having a policy relative to deposits into the OPEB account from free cash, some percentage of that. We talked about sort of making that more official. This would just be item two on that list. I agree with you. Yeah, it would certainly be very official. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. I mean, I think that it's pretty, it's, it's not that complicated, and it's something that we can talk about. And you know, we, we should fold in, at some point, not necessarily prior to town meeting, we really ought to have a focused discussion on exactly what we should be doing in terms of our OPEP liability and, and collecting all the wisdom that we have and possibly even having um, someone from Standard & Poor's or Moody's come and, and talk to us about that. What I, mean, I have read the Standard & Poor's literature on it and I'm a little confused about what they're recommending because they don't seem to be saying anything real clear. All right. Um, well, we're on to minutes now, remarkably enough. <laughs> we have a meeting that gets out early. And other. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> Does anybody have any? Let's let's elevate <clears throat> other in front of minutes for a minute. Does anything anybody wants to talk about? Let me just throw something out. Uh, when institutions of higher learning build a building, they put names on everything, and then they get people to contribute for putting names on everything. And if we're going to build this new Wellington building, why not rent out the name of each classroom? Because that's what they do, and you cut down the cost of it. And you can't get your name on a Harvard building unless you have $100 million. Uh, so you could get a lot cheaper name on a building or a, a classroom or something else uh, if you rented out all the names on all of the new classrooms in the new school. Well, that's, you know, that's a useful idea. And do that. the, um, Peg, you're on the Senior Center Building Committee, right? I mean, they had a huge fundraising program and raised not insubstantial sum of money for the senior center, but I don't remember them selling off. No. They did. They did. There's, there's a McLaughlin right. classroom right. at Suffolk Law School yeah. for a few bucks. Well, they ought to be one of the Wellington School, too, haven't they? Well, well, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, but it comes down to putting out your own, you know, but we will, they were looking for a, a, a substantial donation and not a man paying Did they get it? No. no. Okay. Um, we had we had donations in excess of $100,000, and that did not get it. They didn't cut it. Yes. This is just a, a general comment in terms of the budget process. I'm sure we're going to continue to discuss this uh, throughout <coughs> our remaining meetings. But, but as we discussed, and we're going to get by this year without an operating override, and the structural deficit likely will increase, and we're faced with these issues next year, I, mean, I, I think we never, very early on, need to start to consider a, a process that is different than what we went through this year, and that means building budgets from the ground up working collaboratively with the schools in discussion of what their budget issues are, are as well, rather than sort of uh, piecemealing it, having meetings in which there's a lot of emotion expressed, uh, so on and so forth. It just seems to me, maybe not, maybe there isn't a better way, but very early on in the fall when we start to meet again, we need to think about a different approach that makes sense and not, not faced with uh, last minute decisions on whether there's an override and what the amount's going to be, so on and so forth. Maybe there's not a better way, but it seems to me there should be. If it's a better way. Okay, well, you know, now, uh, Mark, are well stated. Ways. And, um, you know, it, I will say something at town meeting um, about next year, why, you know, how we got to this point, and then what we think about next year. And, and the, you know, obviously, Good. the honest truth is we don't really know. I mean, we think that we have a, we, we think the next year is going to require an override. Angelo has actually said, uh, several times that we don't really know that. I mean, we assume that that's going to be the case. We don't know for sure what the budget picture is going to look like. We certainly won't know in October with certainty what the budget picture is going to be for FY10. Um, and that's part of the part of the process. I happen to think we're, you know, it's March 26th. The budget is pretty well done. <coughs> we're going to have it done at the April town meeting, which we haven't had in a long time. So we're actually ahead of the game we agree with from prior progress. years. Yeah. Um, part of the, you know, the to and froing is this sort of conversation about a gap, and the side of, I always maintain that the gap, the, the side, the side of the gap that's defined by your revenues kind of stays fixed. I mean, that doesn't change a lot. The, the gap defined by what you would like to spend can vary quite a lot. And so part of the gap is shrinking what we want to spend every year. So. You know, and, and we always start out in January with, a, with a, a people saying they'd like to spend a lot of money, and then it gets cut back. And you know, that's just part of the process. Um, part of the process is also waiting until certain kinds of information becomes available. You know, we don't know until February what the assessor situation is going to be. Even later, usually, they were generous and, and, and came to a conclusion earlier. We don't really know until February or March um, what the you know, how with the school's $40 million budget, what their health insurance account's going to look like. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you have to wait in order to to really understand what it's going to be. So I appreciate that there could well be a better way, and we'll certainly talk about it. Um, but I don't feel profoundly unhappy about the way it was done this year. So, uh, What Mark said, I think, is right. There, I, I don't think the question is whether there's going to be an operational override next year. I think the question is how much. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got to start letting everybody know that, yeah, there will be an operational override next year. Well, is there any real question after you've squeezed everything out of every last account that you can play with in order to, to do it? 
Sitting here right now, I, I would I wouldn't think that there was, but you know, I just you just and, and I'm prepared to say that. I just don't I don't want to guarantee something that I don't know for sure. There could be some state legislation, for example, that that, that changes the oh, casinos, funding. Huh? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. You can count on that not happening. <laughs> there is no change. To what? No, there's school, no way school, funding. school funding. You're gonna if, casinos. We're going to lose, fun, not gain, funding, right. if the anything. State 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 the 17 percent goal. goal line, the gu guidelines. That, no, we may get the last two years of that, but yeah. that's that's it. We're not going to get any more. That's right. no. The state picture. We may well get less, there, but that that's substantial. No, no, it's, it but that's out. already built in. We it's already that. built into this year. No, it's built in next as well in terms of. What yeah, we'll but we don't some. get the 17 percent until when? Two, two more years. years. Two more years. Right. So. But it doesn't change the picture, but marginally. Doesn't really we, change. we, everybody, we will definitely take a look at, and I will, um, in concert with everyone else, take a look at how we can do this better next year and avoid, avoid a lot of the public anxiety over, you know. I mean, don't get me wrong, Phil. My, my comments weren't meant to criticize you know, anyone in particular and, and, and how we do things. I've now been on here a fourth year, and it just seems to me that a <clears throat> different approach, if there is one, I don't know if there is, but a different approach makes sense to me, a more collaborative approach to things as well, uh, amongst all of the stakeholders in the budget process. Uh, and frankly, building from the ground up is a better way than, than not when you know what your revenues are. Well, that goes back to the zero-based budget initiative. I knew you were going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to bring hey. Yeah, two comments. I think it is important to note that we are earlier this year than we have been. That's already been stated, but I, I'm not sure we could start any earlier than we did this year around the budget. And when we do think about um, budget planning for next year, one of the things I don't think that worked very well this year was the opportunity that each of the departments had to, to list what their reductions would be. Um, if need be, because some departments did do that, others didn't do it. I'm not sure how seriously that piece was taken. And, and I think the hope is always that we don't have to make those reductions, but I think everybody should operate from the perspective that it's a possibility and really take it very, very seriously. Thank you. Um, I, I, I really appreciate what both both Mark and, and Walter said, and, and thank you. I appreciate everything. But um, my own sense is, and having been one of the progenitors of this uh, school committee proposal, you know, to look at sort of three ballot questions: a roads override, a Wellington debt exclusion, and uh, an override for operational purposes. My argument would be that moving forward over the next 12 months. It would be a real mistake, in my personal opinion, to let any appreciable amount of time after town meeting go by without having a very serious public discussion about these three items. Assuming the rules of override passes, that'd be great. Um, and I certainly would support that. I would encourage all school supporters to support it because you know, the town has worked very hard to, to meet our needs this year. But anyway, while the pain of this year's budget process is still in our minds, and while we're all very conscious about what the Wellington's likely to cost us, and what the sort of parameters of an override are going to need to be. Is it $4 million? Is it $5 million? I, I, I tend to think, like Walter, that's a good forecast can be made. That I think there's going to be a need for a real consistent and maybe steady educational campaign. First, you know, at tables like the school committee, selectmen and warrant committee, um, and then out to the public, beginning as early as May, because I, I hate to see the, the time uh, slip away from us. Uh, one of these three questions, we all know, you know, one of them is going to be on the ballot May, May, the third week of May. The other two are coming. And um, the longer one delays asking the important questions like, what does that override look like? How will we know and when will we know? Um, what's going to be, is it going to be something for more than one year? Uh, are people going to have a chance to load in things that they would like to do for enhancements? Or are we just going to hope to hang on for study? I mean, there are a lot of policy questions that groups like the Warren Committee, the schools, and the, and the selectmen, could and in my mind should talk about earlier rather than later. So I would argue that May and June might be better months to set a framework in place in the context of all three of these ballot questions than waiting until the fall and sort of saying, okay, let's start up the FY10 budget process. Because I think we are in a very, we're at a time where the public seems to recognize we have some very important things to talk about. And the more we talk about them in relation to one another and with the realization that each one hits the wallets of the people, um, you know, in certain ways. Um, I think the stronger the chances are that the public listens to all three of them. Uh, first, two pile ones. I'll go back to what Scott was saying in a minute, but uh, 
for Peg. Uh, the departments, I do believe, took that seriously through the efforts of the department heads in Barber and the whole budgeting process this year. We did have that reduction plan built into the budget. So when it did have to occur that we did have to make reductions, they had already had their input into it. We used that as the basis for making the reductions. <coughs> so it was very easy for us to make those reductions because we had already planned months in advance that this could possibly occur. So that's why you had that list so very easily made available. We just had to pick and choose which items we were going to do. The second part, to what Scott was referring to, we had already discussed this at our monthly department head meeting uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with Floyd and Barbara and the department heads. And half in jest, but half in truth, it said, after town meeting, let's take two weeks off to get our batteries recharged, you know, you'll see the results, how it turned out. And then start begin the process of planning, putting the team together what we need to look at for what, how we're going to address the FY10 budget. Are we looking at enhancements? Are we looking at you know, leveling it? How are we going to plan this out? So we're not looking at this as starting the process in October. We're looking at this as probably starting the process, at least the building blocks of that, uh, right after April Town Meeting. I, I just, uh, I, I agree with Walter and Mark's comments, and I think perhaps what could be helpful is to start the policy discussion sooner than later in the subcommittee process as opposed to waiting for the numbers. Uh, it may require the subcommittees to go back to the numbers during the budget process, but uh, at least we understand the policy concerns and interests. Just a, a quick thing. I know we're talking about the debt exclusions and so on, but there's a lot of talk about a library debt exclusion. There's also some talk about a police station debt exclusion. I think we ought to get all of these potential issues out on the table, not just Wellington, not just the, the uh, operating override no 10. And there's, there's a whole bunch of things I think the public needs to hear. And we've talked about, you know, laundry list of things giving people choices. But I think we need to get everything out on the table, not just the ones that are going to whack us first. We need to get the whole big picture out there instead of just pieces of it. Well, that could be an argument for another mega meeting. Fall. Well, there might be, and I don't know if that's yeah, the right yeah, way to do it. Uh, again, I, if, if we're looking at a time, a three-year time frame, I don't see either one of those coming in in that, in that time frame. I don't disagree with you, but you listen to the library folks. They're pushing hard. They're going ahead, making plans, you know, to, to do that. So it's not as though they dropped this and don't want it to go away. So we're going to have to deal with that at some point. Okay. No. Well, no, your point's well taken, though. That we ought to understand. But for voting the Wellington and operating override, people ought to know is the police station a five to ten year or a twenty year proposal or, or what? So you know that's I a good. That's 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 very well said. You have to remember the special feature of Wellington, which is that we we have a hundred and twenty day window if and when the state approves it, which doesn't exist in any of these other projects that I'm right. aware of. Yeah. Right. Nor does forty percent state money. Okay. All right. On to the minutes. I gave my copy to Lisa. Yeah. I don't have my copy. So, um, Chair Ferenzi, would you call your adjustment substantive? I don't have them in front of me, so if they need to be read aloud, I can't do that. My printer. Um, I don't have his changes though. Was, you, so which the, minutes, which minutes are we talking about? Is um, there's one. There's one that I would call substantive, and that's the uh, um, the one that I. It was under the health insurance increase, right? The, under the health. Do you have the? Do you have the minutes? I there? have the minutes. I just don't have your. We can put it. You on. could do it. No, no, no. We don't need to do it. Just one. Just get out of the way. The the only change was in the um, uh, discussion of the fall Senate around a 3.5 percent increase assistance. For, why don't we just put out a revised one? And do yeah, it. let's wait and do it. Yeah, yeah. all right. And I it was just that it was, we would, the only change was that we did not go to the Insurance Advisory Committee. It was, yeah. was subject to their input. Okay, we'll, we'll circulate right, it. So I'll email his adjustment. Yeah, and we'll okay. take him up for next time. Uh, <coughs> and we'll adjourn. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I was just